Thank you. Please be seated. Please be seated. Thanks so much. It's wonderful to be back in Seminole County. I want to thank Sheriff Lima for hosting us. Uh, we've got uh, two uh, good bill signings and then another really important announcement uh, to continue to make progress on fighting uh, fentanyl and an opioid overdose. And uh, we've had some success, but there's a lot more to do. Uh, we are joined today, of course, by, uh, by the sheriff. We're also joined by Florida Surgeon General, Dr. Joseph Latipo, uh, Secretary. Uh, DCF Secretary uh, Siobhan Harris. We have Senators Broder and Collins, Representatives Placencia and Plakin. Uh, we have Travis McAllister, Director of Recovery Support, uh, SMA Healthcare, and then Jackie Siegel, co-founder, Victoria's Voice Foundation. So you'll be hearing from some of them uh, as we go. And, and Doug Bankson, where's he at? I didn't see. Oh, good, thank you for coming, great. Uh, uh, so that's good. Well, we know that you have massive amounts of fentanyl pouring into this country at the U.S.-Mexico border. And that is something that has had huge impacts on communities all across the United States of America. It's not just a southern border problem. Uh, this fentanyl ends up in communities from coast to coast. And as we know, uh, this stuff, when it gets into these different uh, pills or whatnot, is incredibly, incredibly deadly. And so we have uh, been setting records as a country for the amount of opioid overdose deaths driven a lot of it by the fentanyl coming across the southern border. So you have over 100,000 Americans every year uh, are now dying because of these drug overdoses fueled by the fentanyl crisis. And uh, we have done what we can as the state of Florida to actually help with the border. We've sent uh, National Guard, we've sent law enforcement, we've done a lot of different things. We're happy to do that because I think it's an American problem, not just a, a Texas problem. And the federal government has really just not done the job that it needs to do and has really helped facilitate the mess that we're in. Uh, and we're proud to do that. Uh, but we also understand that uh, we can't do that ourselves. It's not even our, our, our border. Uh, federal government ultimately needs to be able to solve the problem. They're not solving it. So you are going to see uh, effects of this in our communities uh, here in Florida. And the one thing about the, the fentanyl is you know, some of these drugs, like not that they're, that they're, they're not good to do, but if you do some type of drug and it is laced with fentanyl, the chance of you dying goes up tremendously. And there's a lot of these uh, opioid uh, deaths that is really poison, poisoning people with fentanyl because maybe someone buys a pill thinking it's something else, it's laced with fentanyl, and then all of a sudden uh, that one pill could be enough uh, to kill somebody. And that happens, uh, unfortunately, uh, a lot. And, and I've been able to meet um, a lot of the, the, the angel moms. I've met moms and dads who've lost um, uh, uh, their kids. Uh, because of this, and and way more often than not, it's um, something where you know they weren't drug addicts; they just did something that they didn't know necessarily what was in, and um, and the consequences uh, can be fatal very quickly. So this is a huge scourge. This is a huge uh, epidemic, and we've done a lot since I've been governor. Uh, to push back on it. First of all, my first year as governor, we created a statewide task force on opioid abuse, and that is uh, being spearheaded by the Attorney General, but they have over the years provided us with policy recommendations that we've been able to uh, implement. For example, these mobile response teams that we have uh, to respond to, to opioid overdoses uh, came out of, of that task force, and we've been implementing that. We're actually going to be doing more uh, in the ensuing uh, months and years. We also established the Coordinated Opioid Recovery Network, the CORE Network. So this is the first time uh, we've had a statewide comprehensive solution. This is in 2022. Uh, we started with, I think, 12 counties, uh, focusing on a lot of the counties that had really significant impacts from this. And what we were trying to do is, because you had a revolving door, someone would go, they'd have an overdose, they'd go to the hospital, they get revived and then they just get discharged and it was gonna happen again. And it's just a, it's just a vicious cycle. So the core network really uh, aims to uh, stop 
that revolving door of addiction and overdose by providing individuals with the tools and resources to choose an alternative path forward to sustainable recovery. I'm going to have an, um, part of the announcement is going to be talking about how we're expanding this, and I'll talk a little bit more about the success that we've had with it, uh, which is really important uh, when we get to there. We've also, since I've been governor, increased penalties against drug dealers and those seeking to distribute dangerous substances like fentanyl as well as methamphetamine. And so these have really strong uh, sentencing guidelines, mandatory sentences that are, that are stiff. And we think that that's appropriate because when you're putting fentanyl in our communities, um, you know, you are killing people and you need to be treated like the murderer that you are. So we're doing that in the state of Florida, and especially when you market this to kids by putting it in candy and things like that, we have even better penalties to be able to throw at you. So, uh, so, so it's been an, an effort really across the board uh, to push back on that. Now, we're here today because we want to be able to do even more. Uh, so the first thing, the first bill we're going to sign is Senate Bill 718, which says, and you have these situations. So with fentanyl, I think a lot of people know this, but I think some people are still surprised. You don't even really have to ingest it to potentially have, like knowingly take something. I mean, if you get in contact with residue, if there's other stuff, I mean, it is very, very dangerous. We actually had a case in Florida, unfortunately, a family was renting an Airbnb unit and you had a young, young baby that was crawling on the carpet and there had been residue left over from, I guess, whoever was using it before, it was fentanyl residue and it killed the baby just from being in contact on a carpet. So, so this is nasty stuff and you have situations where when law enforcement personnel are responding to these situations that fentanyl may be involved in, you know, they really are putting themselves at risk because it's not like they have to start popping pills to be affected by this. So this bill 718 uh, provides that any adult uh, who through unlawful possession or, uh, of dangerous fentanyl or analogs exposes any first responder to that fentanyl that results in overdose or serious bodily injury, uh, that we're gonna prosecute you as a second degree felon for doing that. And so if, you, if an officer says, do you have drugs in your possession uh, and you lie and then the officer ends up getting exposed and harms, uh, we're going to throw the book at you and we're going to hold you accountable. Uh, we want to make sure that the people that wear the uniform um, are protected. And so this is an important step to be able to do that. Uh, I'm also signing Senate Bill 66, which designates June 6 as Revive Awareness Day. Uh, it is called Victoria's Law and it encourages the Florida Department of Health to hold events to raise awareness of the dangers of opioid overdose and the safe use of opioid uh, counteractants. And you'll hear from uh, Jackie Siegel about that, which we think is very, very important. And that's the thing. I think it's just the, the it's part of this is education, knowing that this is very, very perilous stuff to be involved with in any kind. And even if you're not knowingly seeking out a fentanyl product, you may be seeking out another product that has that in there unwittingly, uh, and that can be devastating. So finally, we're proud to be able to announce that our core network, we are going to expand uh, this network. Uh, we started, as I said, with 12 counties in July of 2022. Uh, we focused on some of the counties that had some of the highest occurrences of fatal and non-fatal overdoses in Florida, and, uh, and also, uh, unfortunately, neonatal uh, abstinence syndrome. Uh, now, nationwide statistics uh, have shown that less than 20% of adults with an opioid addiction have received medication to treat the addiction in the past year. Uh, the core clinics in Florida have exceeded that with close to 50% of patients receiving medication-assisted treatment. And so thanks to this network, Florida's treatment providers, hospitals, and emergency responders are now collaborating uh, more than they have ever before. Uh, this network provider, uh, the people that are in this network as providers, they've responded to nearly 18,000 emergency calls which resulted in a life saved since the inception of the program. Uh, we have seen since this program was launched 
we have seen a reduction in the number of emergency medical services responses necessary uh, for drug overdose. State level data shows 607 fewer EMS responses to suspected overdose from when this program started. That's a 3% reduction. We are on a pathway to continue to see stiff increases. From January to June in 2023, core counties Duval and Escambia uh, saw a drop of 176 and 146 EMS calls respectively uh, for suspected opioid uh, overdose compared to the same period in 2022. Uh, Pinellas County, 406 fewer emergency medical services responses during the same time. Uh, and this was the largest reduction in emer emergency medical service responses to suspected overdoses across the 12 core counties. So uh, overdose deaths across Florida uh, are now on the decline. We have a 9%. We have a 9% decrease from September of 22 to September of 23 compared to the previous year's statewide count. Um, and after seeing the good things that this program has done, uh, I'm, we worked and said, okay, you know, if, it's, if, it, if it doesn't work, then fine, and we'll do something else. But if it's working, then we want to make sure that we make this available to other counties. And so today, uh, I'm pleased to say that we are going to build off the success of those original 12 counties, and we are going to expand Florida's core network to 17 additional counties throughout the state of Florida. This includes counties like, uh, all the counties are Bay County, Broward, Collier, Hernando, Hillsborough, Indian River, Lake, Lee, Leon, Miami-Dade, Monroe, Okaloosa, Orange, Polk, Sarasota, Seminole, and St. Lucie County. So that's a lot of people that are gonna be impacted by this. We're proud of that. So we will now have a total of 29 core counties in the state of Florida, uh, which will save lives and place Florida at the forefront of combating the opioid epidemic. And I mean, obviously we have 67 counties in the state, 29 now core counties, but if you look at where these counties are, um, someone can do the math on this, but I guarantee you that's the overwhelming majority of population in, this, in, this, in the state are now uh, represented in a county that has this ability to have a really integrated and effective response to opioid addiction. So we're proud of everyone that's been involved in that. Uh, this has made an impact across the state of Florida. I know the legislation that I'm signing today is also going to have an impact in the state of Florida. And, um, you know, it's a difficult problem. It's a, I wish there was just a switch we could turn on and never have to deal with this again. I wish there was one magic bill you can sign and never have to deal with it again. But the reality is you've got to approach this from a variety of different ways. Uh, and so, yes, we've thrown the book at the fentanyl traffickers, which is very important. We've been strong advocates for stopping the stuff coming over the border, which, of course, you need to do. Uh, but you also have to deal with the treatment side of this and have those uh, available interventions so that people can, can get back on their feet and, and live productive lives. You also have to have uh, the demand side and fight on the education side. And the First Lady has done a lot of this by going into schools and providing education on really the perils about what's out there. Um, you know, you go like the 1960s, like the stuff they were doing, not that that was right, but like the stuff that's out there now is so much more dangerous uh, and so much more potent that you may be thinking you're taking something and it could be laced with fentanyl and that could be all she wrote just right there. So the stakes are very high and we want young people in particular to know that, that this is a really, really serious risk uh, to be indulging in any of this stuff off the street. So we've done that. Uh, we've had success. There's a lot more to do uh, today is going to help us get uh, further down the path of where we need to go. So we've got a lot of great people who are going to come up and talk. So first, I'm going to kick it off uh, with the Surgeon General of the State of Florida, Dr. Joe Latipo. Thank you, Governor. Thank you, Governor. It's always always a pleasure to to uh, to be in this man's shadow or to be next to him. I want to say before we talk more about core that you know the governor was saying that 
he was he wanted he wanted a switch to be able to just end the problem. But in the absence of a switch, you know, he was. He mentioned that approaching the problem from different ways was what we were doing. And it, it seems like a simple statement, but it, it actually highlights something that's, that's very important and why so many people are drawn to him and admire him and appreciate him, which is that it's, it's such a uh, common sense and grounded idea that you know, for a problem that's complex, We'll try different strategies that make sense to tr to address the problem, and that is actually unique right now because we have so many things happening at leadership levels at the federal level. You know whether it's boys playing in girls teams and winning titles, or other just things that don't make sense. That that having an individual, in this case a man, who does make sense just stands in, in sharp contrast and is very refreshing for a lot of Floridians and a lot of Americans. So it's, it's one of the things I really appreciate about the government. You know, who thought it would be controversial to allow girls to compete with other girls and, and not have to compete with boys? Whoever would have thought, you know, I don't think any of our parents would have ever thought that would have been controversial. Well, so core. As the, as the governor said, one of the, one of the aspects is of our opioid strategy is the coordinated opioid recovery network. So this is our core network. The governor described some of the components. And when we first talked about the program, and it's really thanks to my deputy secretary, Dr. Ken Shepke, who's an emergency department doctor and uh, worked in Palm Beach where this program was piloted. When we first talked about this program a while ago, in the governor's office and talked about even just expanding it to the 12 that it, it currently exists in, one of the things we talked about was the fact that it's a common sense, it, it has a lot of common sense elements. So it, a lot of people, most people in fact, who are addicted to opioids or some other medication, they don't want to be in that state. They want to be out of addiction. But addiction is a powerful dragon. I mean, it's a powerful monster, right? It, it sucks people's their spiritual, their spiritual uh, uh, existence, it sucks at their energetic existence, it sucks at their physical existence with, with cravings, it sucks at everything. I mean, it, it drains people, and it's very hard to overcome, and most people don't overcome it. But because people, most people want to be rid of their addiction, that presents an opportunity to, to try and make it more feasible to achieve that goal. And those are the components that are why CORE is as effective as it has been and should have been, should be effective. We, we talked about before expanding it how the fact, how, you know, I anticipated it would be effective. And, you know, what are those components? So one of the things is that it brings people closer to help. So when someone overdoses or at whatever point someone feels like they are, you know, they, they want to try and get help, say they come into the emergency department because of an overdose, or maybe they got naloxone in the field, and they come in the emergency department, and, and now, you know, they're, they've recovered, they're breathing again. I've, I've seen patients like that in the emergency department, and every time, just about every time, when someone's in that situation, the next thing they want to do is leave, and usually to satisfy that craving again. And what one of the things that CORE does is that right in that setting, when that patient is, is wants help, but is still dealing with this dragon that's sitting on their, sitting on their shoulders, there's, there's a, a, a connector, a person there to help that person either initiate therapy with, with our things like Suboxone, medications that can help alleviate at least a physical component of addiction, and uh, peer navigators. So people, you know, there's, there's nothing more powerful uh, just about than someone else who has walked in the same shoes. I mean, it's very powerful, right? Because it's not just, it's, it's, a, it's a total experience, right? Experiencing all the components of addiction and having survived it and, and really gotten out of it. And that's a very special type of human resource. So CORE connects people with those types of resources and connects them promptly so that, you know, in that 
period where there's a window, and that window's always closing. But when there's a window where that person wants help, they can reach out and, and get some help. And that's why CORE has been, been successful. It's just really just common sense, thinking about the problem, uh, thinking about the solutions. And uh, the solution is not to have boys playing on girls' sports. So, so it's just that common sense that, that CORE brings. And it's part of why it's, it's been successful. It's part of why I'm sure it appealed to the governor when we were all talking about it in his office you know, a year, a year and a half ago. I lose track of time things in this job. And, um, and it's part of why I'm happy that we're expanding it. So in the, just with the dozen the counties that it's at, CORE has helped touch tens of thousands of, of lives of people who are addicted. Uh, it's been very successful, and that's meant success not only for those people, but for their loved ones, right? Their husbands, wives, their partners, their, their kids. So it's just, I mean, it's like you can't do much better good, right, than, than saving someone's life and, and helping them be, you know, still be around and still be, you know, have a positive impact in the lives of those people that care about them. So, so it's really, you know, it's just a, a really terrific aspect of the, of the program. And uh, the other, something else that, you know, CORE does just to try to be comprehensive is it tries to help people with all those surrounding problems. So oftentimes, for example, people have problems with housing, uh, people may have problems with just buying food, uh, other components of life, financial stuff, and CORE has partners in the community to help, you know, sort of help, again, support people get to getting through that really challenging and acute period of, where they're trying to escape the, the trap that they're in with, uh, with addiction. So eventually, you know, the, the switch that the governor mentioned, he, he doesn't know it, you may not know it, but it, it does exist, and it's, it's stress and trauma. And that is the core of all addiction, is stress and trauma, ultimately. And uh, I hope that in my lifetime we'll actually be able to make more headway on that. That's actually something that's very important to me, even though we don't hear much about it in the certain general position with the stuff that we do in the Department of, Public, uh, Department of Health. But that's, that is the, that's the core of it. And, and that is the magic switch. And, and we are, I think, I'm sure, in fact, that the future is headed that way. All right, thank you. I will now introduce, I think the governor will introduce uh, Secretary Siobhan here. Yep. Thank you so much, Governor DeSantis. It's an honor to join you, Dr. Latipo, Sheriff Lima, Senator Broder, along with so many other key stakeholders on this monumental day. In my role, I am keenly aware of the damage opioid addiction causes families and the ripple effect it has throughout our communities. I'm incredibly proud that the state of Florida has been proactive in fighting this epidemic, and we're equally fortunate to have leaders like the governor, the lieutenant governor, the first lady, and the attorney general who've been unyielding advocates. Their support for innovation has been pivotal and resulted in some of the strongest laws and policies backed by strategic financial investments that have allowed us to amplify treatment services, medication-assisted treatment, mobile medication-assisted treatment, and so many others. The two bills that will be signed into law are shining examples of the continued commitment in combating harm caused by fentanyl and other illicit drugs, including protecting our first responders and raising awareness on the use of opioid antagonists. Under the leadership of the governor, we've distributed more than 400,000 life-saving naloxone kits across the state in 2023, a 112% increase compared to 2022. Equally exciting this morning, as you heard from the Surgeon General and the Governor, is the announcement of the continued expansion of CORE. We're so elated to see the progress that we've seen in the 12 counties and look forward to seeing the progress as we continue to expand into additional counties, hopefully making it available eventually statewide. Our greatest hope is getting people to never use drugs in the first place. And through prevention initiatives like the First Lady's The Facts Your Future, we will make strides in accomplishing that goal, in, particularly, in particular with our youth. 
But for those who are struggling through the recovery process now, evidence-based programs like CORE help to ensure that they can get the right care at the right time, particularly during the initial and very fragile days of recovery, where a coordinated and robust system amplifies our, op our opportunity for success. The Florida Department of Health has been an exceptional partner in the development and implementation of CORE, and we look forward to the continued collaboration with them, Florida's emergency department, emergency medical services, treatment clinics, and community stakeholders. With such strong and dedicated leaders in our state, it's no wonder Florida continues to lead. And on behalf of the department and everyone we serve, thank you. Sheriff. Well, well, welcome back to Seminole County, Governor, and uh, it's great to see so many uh, friends out in the room. We have all of our county commissioners here, our county manager, a lot of the Seminole County elected officials, Andre Bailey from Project Opioid, and of course, David and Jackie Siegel with Victoria's Voice. Uh, you know, I've, I learned early on in the DeSantis administration a new definition. It was called DeSantis time. And in the early stages of this, uh, the governor and the first lady and the attorney general actually allowed me to participate on a lot of these efforts, whether it's uh, the statewide opioid task force or various things. And I saw the passion and the drive that he had to make sure that this was addressed in a comprehensive way. This is why people are leaving their states, moving to the state of Florida to follow leadership like Governor Ron DeSantis. I'm telling you, absolutely. <laughs> As a result of that work and, and the past few years, the governor has signed into law bills that, that simply do not exist in other areas of the country. Uh, we knew what you heard from the Surgeon General that this has to be a comprehensive approach and we've actually said that you can't arrest your way out of this problem. But I'm telling you, arrest does make a significant dent when you hold the drug dealers accountable and the laws that the governor has signed in the laws that has brought to his desk by our legislative body have absolutely done that. And here in Seminole County, we've now charged 35 drug dealers with first degree murder for dealing deadly doses of narcotics. That is significant. <laughs> During last legislative session, the governor also signed a bill that does not exist anywhere else that we talk about the importance of reviving and that's the greatest responsibility of a society is to to deploy naloxone and, and an opioid antagonists and bring people back. But until the governor signed a law on the books, people quite literally could get away with murder. So now in the state of Florida, there's a law that says, if you're revived with Narcan and we can prove that you're the drug dealer that sold the drugs, you can now be charged with se second degree felony culpable negligence for dealing that dose because we know that every other person that is receiving those drugs from that drug dealer is likely to experience similar fate. Again, we have so much to be grateful for what's going on here in the state of Florida. Uh, these new bills uh, that are coming out today. Uh, first, CORE. CORE was the inspiration behind this collaborative approach that we have with Advent Health here in Seminole County and throughout Central Florida. It was the governor and the first ladies and the attorney general's decision and direction that helped serve as a spirit behind what we do here today that is absolutely resulting in a reduced number of fatalities for overdoses and poisonings, increased amount of prosecutions for drug dealers, and a recipe that just simply is working. In addition to that, we know that we now face a time where six out of every 10 pills that are on the street contain a lethal dose of fentanyl. Fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine, 50 times more potent than heroin, and a microgram uh, is a lethal dose. The governor and the first lady also said that the greatest thing that we can do to prevent somebody from experiencing a drug overdose is to never start in the first place. And the first lady has toured the state having high school uh, auditorium type of venue meetings where we talk about the importance of abstaining and never starting and never going down that path and what the consequences are. This is what's making a difference in our community and is the spirit of the momentum and the growth that is occurring across the country. Second, 
expanding that core, expanding that concept for people in communities that may not have the financial range. So this growing of, of, of this effort and providing this holistic strategy is moving our, our community, moving our, our society, and protecting those most vulnerable within our communities. And last and certainly not least, additional laws that hold drug dealers accountable when they intentionally expose a public safety professional to these deadly substances is just, once again, I think the Surgeon General said it, it just makes sense. It seems incredibly obvious, but again, uh, Governor DeSantis, it is an honor to, 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 to be here in the state of Florida, to partner with you and your effort and the difference that you made. People have counted on you and your leadership, and you have not let them down. God bless you. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, uh, Sheriff Lima, distinguished guests. It's such an honor to be here today to um, recognize the victorious law for June 6, Revive Awareness Day, because that's going to keep the conversation going about the opioid epidemic and the deaths related to it. And this day, June 6, is a very meaningful day for us because that's the day that our beloved daughter, Victoria Siegel, died of a drug overdose at the age of 18 years old. She had a whole life to live and it was taken away too soon by these terrible drugs. Um, the drug epidemic is getting worse and it's the number one cause of death for people between the ages of 18 and 45 and it's a growing number of causes of death for children as young as around 14 years old. There's, um, there's, uh, they're doing vapes that are laced with fentanyl. There's fentanyl that looks like candy. And it's really, um, this is some, a death that could be prevented. So my husband and I, David Siegel, we formed the Victoria's Voice Foundation. And um, he's really my driving force. And also um, my guardian angel, when she passed away, it's like a trigger went off in, in me. And I realized we didn't want other parents to suffer the pain and agony that we suffered. So we decided to spend the rest of our lives to save, to spare other people's um, children and loved ones from this, this pain. Um, since Victoria's voice, um, since we started, we've, uh, we have speakers going around to schools and we've reached out to over a million parents and children just as of last month for the schools that we've reached. So we're very happy for that. We have also secured a bipartisan resolution declaring June 6th as a, the National Naloxone Awareness Day. And um, also our daughter, uh, two weeks ago, we had a ceremony in, at the DEA Museum up in Washington, D.C., and her picture is now up there with uh, thousands of other um, people who died of a drug overdose. Also, um, I, our family was the first family to be in the, the national press about losing a child from the drug overdose. It was always a very hush, private thing. Parents would always say that their children um, died of the natural causes. But um, I, I realized that with the TV shows that we're doing and with that fame and recognition, and um, it, it really is more important to not be shameful, but to use that fame to, as a platform to get in the door, to speak to the press, and, and talk about the drug epidemic. We published Victoria's diary, which was her dying wish. Uh, we have the diary and the naloxone actually in the gift bags in the back, so I want everyone to grab one of those on the way out. And everything I do be, be, between our reality show and the Broadway show that's being launched this summer in Boston, it's called The Queen of Versailles, um, in our contracts, we require them to bring the awareness about the drug epidemic and Victoria's voice in, in everything that we do. So, <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and in the Broadway show, it's actually, um, they do feature Victoria um, and her journey through the drug epidemic. So it's a very um, 
uh, important story, and I don't know um, if I could even get any more awareness out there um, in, in the way of the entertainment field. I mean, it's better than a movie. Oh, and I do have um, a, a movie that we made called Princess of Versailles that um, shows the grief of how me and my husband handled the loss of our daughter. And it was it's on my YouTube channel. It's called, my YouTube channel is The Real Queen of Versailles, but the movie that we put on there, and it's free for everyone, The Princess of Versailles. And it's, it's just like a, a homemade movie. So I'm not like a great producer. I'd rather be on the other side of the camera. Um, so anyways, um, we, um, one other thing that we did is we, Victoria's Voice launched a Get, Give, Save um, campaign, which is about get naloxone, give naloxone, save a life. If our daughter, if the first responders had naloxone when our daughter overdosed, she would still be here today. So that's why this um, Get, Give, Save program is so important. And um, we could not save Victoria, but we pray that her legacy, including the Revive Awareness Day, will save a, a life of a loved one for many people in this room and around the world. So I, I am so grateful to you, Governor, Sheriff Lima, my family, and everyone else, our Victoria's Voice Foundation, and everyone who made today possible in signing this into law. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. <laughs> Thank you, Governor. My name is Senator Jason Broder, and I am going to back clean up, so we'll get to it soon. Uh, and I want to tie together a couple of themes for you that you heard today and make you very proud of being in this community and in this state. Because I think the way this came about, the commitment that we've shown, uh, not only legislatively, but this administration, Governor and the First Lady have been from day one committed to it, uh, making sure that our communities are safe. Uh, you heard that there are a number of different ways that we can combat this. It's a multifunctional or multifactorial problem. And over the years, yes, we've gotten hard on criminals, and we've made sure the penalties are stiffer, but this today is a way to say there are other alternatives out there so that we don't even have to go down that path. I want to thank my colleagues from the legislature. Senator Collins is here. Thank you for making the trip over from Tampa. Uh, Representative Placenti and Representative Bankson. And of course, the sponsor in the House for this, Representative Plakin. Thank you so much for being here and doing this. And so this bill has three components. And you've heard from uh, Jackie and David Siegel. And thank you so much for lending your story. People ask you, how do you get ideas for bills? And the truth is, you have committed community members who come to you and say, hey, this is a problem. And fortunately, with the relationships we have here in the county and in the state, having the sheriff on the opioid task force for the state, one of the first phone calls you make. And he says, yes, it is a problem. And then you talk to our agencies and you get Secretary Harris and Dr. Latipo, and they said, let me tell you some more stories. And you heard the story about the baby and the Airbnb, and you go, I can't believe that's true. Well, listen to the agency heads. Listen to your community members who say, you know, you get some kid who spends 25 bucks on a Xanax because he thinks he's going to have a fun weekend, and there's a microgram of fentanyl in it, and that's it. And it's tragic and awful, and it can be avoided for a couple of things. A little over a year ago, the FDA now allowed for uh, naloxone, which is Narcan, to be over the counter. Everybody can have access to it, so that in the event that there is some kind of avoidable harm that happens, people have access to a life-saving drug. The greater the education, the greater the awareness, the more we are not going to go through the senseless tragedies that are being the inspiration for all the things you heard Jackie just mention. We are honored and thrilled that you would be here and lend your name to this for the Seagulls. Thank you very much. I think June 6th and Victoria's Day is going to be a time that we remember. You can make a difference by getting involved and making sure everyone knows just how dangerous that is. We're very, very fortunate that uh, we have uh, the sheriff here in our community leading the way. And we're exceptionally proud and lucky to have Governor DeSantis be able to have this commitment, both he and the First Lady, making sure that all the way along the spectrum we're providing the tools necessary to the community to make sure this happens. Thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to the sheriff. Thank you to the agency heads and the governor. And thank you to the Seagulls for being here today to make this a reality.
Well, thanks for everybody who's uh, participated. Thanks for the members of the legislature that helped uh, help with this and get this on, on the governor's desk. And then thanks for everybody who, who have been uh, active in this effort. I mean, there's, uh, I think the speakers all pointed out, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a lot uh, that, that, that has been done and there's a lot that we're gonna continue to do. So all the participants who wanna be uh, here for this, you could come now uh, if you wanna get around the, the signing table. Uh, protecting them to fentanyl against fentanyl exposure. at the office right there. show finishes yeah 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 that's like a big joke of ours <laughs> Great. So, um, so thanks for everyone who's been involved in this, and there's been a lot that's been done. I mean, you know, the, the fentanyl is obviously there's a law and order component to it. We've been uh, very upfront about being strong on that. One of these bills does that, but there's also the awareness and the treatment, which are very, very critical. Uh, we're going to be doing more legislation this week that is going to show that Florida is going to continue to lead the way on having law and order and fighting crime and making sure that people have safe communities. So I think you're gonna see over the balance of the week that uh, we really are second to none when it comes to supporting law enforcement and, and holding criminals accountable. And that's what you have to do. That's what they're not doing in some of these other states where things have gone so poorly. So, so I'm excited about not just the two bills we signed today. Obviously, I'm excited about expanding the core network but I'm re really excited about all the great legislation that we're gonna have for public safety. Uh, we're gonna dispose of a lot of that throughout the rest of this week with a lot of great bills to be able to sign into law. So uh, good, on, uh, good on the legislature for, for stepping up and doing that. And I'm looking forward to doing that. I think that'll make Florida stronger and safer as a result. Okay, with that, I'll take a couple questions. Anybody? Yes, sir. Well, that's a great question. So what, what's the relationship between the state and the feds on some of these issues? I mean, I will tell you with respect to border, it's non, basically non-existent. I mean, they are um, pursuing an agenda, which I just don't understand, 
It doesn't make any sense to have this many millions of people coming in unfettered. You're coming from all across the world. You've got people, Chinese nationals, are pouring into this country. Uh, you've got people from the Middle East pouring into this country. Obviously, the Mexican drug cartels are, are ruling the roost at the border, and that's just a failed policy. And so I do think there's probably people that are in maybe the, the, the career slots in, in agencies like DHS who, who don't think the policy is the good policy. But as we know, that's set by the political officials uh, from the president on down. House of Representatives has actually impeached the secretary of DHS in part over the dereliction of duty as, uh, at the border, and I think that that's appropriate. So, so on that sense, uh, I, think it's, I think it's been tough. Obviously, Texas feels that more than we do. Uh, I will say this, though, in terms of the migration, uh, we have been working, so I did an executive order January of 2023, so what is that, 14, 15 months ago, 16 months ago, to see, because you have these boats coming from uh, different places in the Caribbean, and the Coast Guard is out there. They don't have enough assets, and so the administration hasn't provided enough, so we've had our vessels there interdicting, and we've done about 14,000 illegal aliens with state vessels have been interdicted and then sent back. And so now when you have something like <laughs> So now when you have something like, like what's happened in Haiti, and there's always been issues there, but, but it's gotten worse, uh, we surged even more vessels. And so with the Coast Guard, it's not likely you're going to be able to get through that. And so we have not seen a real strong, uh, really any uptick in vessels trying to come from Haiti uh, to Florida. So I think on that issue, we've worked well with the Coast Guard. I think they're just undermanned. But when we stop, I mean, I, I mentioned uh, a month or so ago when we were down in Polk County that there had been an interception of a group of Haitians that had guns and drugs and night vision goggles. Uh, they were intercepted at sea by state officials. They were turned over to the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard brought them back uh, to, to Haiti. And so when you know that that's going to happen, it makes it much less likely that people are going to want to go in and, and try to make that, make that trip. That's a, that's a pretty long trip from Haiti to Florida, and especially given uh, you, know, you need gas, you need all this. If you think you're just going to get stopped and turned around, it's not. And I do think you, you are seeing people leave, but I think they're going to Bahamas and some of these other places. And of course, to get into the United States, it's a lot harder to take a boat to land illegally in Florida, given what we've done, than it is to just fly to Mexico and walk across the daggone border. I mean, how, how is that good policy? So, so that's where we are. So, um, so I think from the supply side, they just are failing the American people at it. Uh, I would want that border uh, really strong. And you know what, some of the apologists will say, well, you know, you know, most of the fentanyl's coming in at the normal ports of entry. Well, first of all, if you didn't have so many people coming illegally, you'd have more personnel at those ports of entry and you'd be able to police that better. But the second thing is we don't really know how much is coming in uh, across the border because there's a lot of people that get across the border and are never apprehended. And, and so clearly, Cartels are going to use whatever avenues they can to be able to do this, but, but it, it's having a huge impact on our society. And, um, you know, you can go any part of this country. Obviously, in Florida, we know uh, other states along the Sun Belt, but you go to North, you go to like Minnesota, you go to Maine, you know, they have these fentanyl overdoses because it really gets everywhere. And it's a tragic. Uh, thing and you know when you're in a position if you're working hard to, to, to address problems not all these are easy problems but to not even try to stop the border and indeed to facilitate more illegal entry over the border that is a failure of leadership yes sir Well, my take is, uh, is evidenced by when I put my John Hancock on the legislation three years ago saying that in Florida, girls have a right to compete against other girls in competitions that have integrity and that are fair. And you can't have a biological male butt into these competitions and win the trophies. It's wrong.
And so I, I think that that's important. I think what we did did is right. And, um, you know, sometimes people will act like, you know, you, you, that not allowing a biological male is somehow an imposition on that athlete, and they don't care about the imposition you're imposing on all these female athletes. I mean, you think about the training and everything that goes into that, and we did, when you had the, the I think it was the 500-yard freestyle where you had the swimmer from Pennsylvania who had been a men's swimmer, I think, for three years, then flipped to the women's team, uh, and then won, quote unquote, that. The second place finisher was actually a swimmer from Sarasota. I think she was at University of Virginia or one of the, one of the schools up there. And um, you know, that's someone that's probably trained for years and years at this, because you don't just get to be competing in NCAA just rolling out of bed. I mean, this is something you're doing when you're young and you're through, through middle school, high school, most likely. And so you're doing that, and then you end up getting a second place finish knowing that if they had just done it by the rules and had women competing against each other, you would have been the national champion. To me, that bothers me. I mean, I want people to know that the hard work will pay off and that you have a right to do that, apply that in competition, that, have, that, that is fair, that, that has integrity to it, uh, that's really what it's all about. And the message that it sends is say, you know what, you do everything right, you work your tail off, you get in a position, and then all of a sudden you can have just the championship taking, taken away from you. And why is it being taken away from these women and these girls who are competing in these competitions? It's doing it because the people, the powers that be in these institutions, like, like the NCAA, some of the high school, not in Florida, but some of these high school, you know, they just don't have the courage to put their foot down and say no. They don't have the courage to do what's right because they're worried about being politically incorrect. Yes, they will get attacked by different groups, of course, probably a lot of media organizations. Um, but you know, uh, that is not what, what leadership is all about. Leadership's about, about doing what's right. And I think what we did that very early on when this, when this was starting, and we actually had a, we had a, a, a runner from Connecticut who was in the high school. And, and lost. I think there were two biological males that, that, that won first and second place in those sprints. And it's just like, okay, you know, that, that's just not right. So, so we're doing it right in Florida. Uh, you know, everyone has a right to compete, uh, but you got to compete, you know, based on, based on the biology. That's the way to do it fairly. And that's the way where people can, particularly our young girls, can know, you know, you work hard, you're going to have a chance to succeed, you're going to have a chance to compete with fairness. Well, okay, so I think most of you guys remember. So, you know, you have these folks, you know, they, 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 Florida has a program to relocate to sanctuary jurisdictions, including Martha's Vineyard, okay? I mean, look. So they, they do it, um, and, and the company that runs this, for the, that was running as a contractor, Everyone who gets on the transportation signs a form saying that they know what they're doing, they're consenting. This is not something that's being done against anybody's will. And so these folks were really had nothing, and they had an opportunity to go to a sanctuary jurisdiction, which had advertised itself as being a place where everyone could come and that nobody is illegal. And yet when they got there, um, all hell broke loose on that island. <laughs> They called out the National Guard. It was like a five-alarm fire. And, you know, you know, they didn't put their money where their mouth is. So after that, and just because it got media attention, some of those folks sued me in the state of Florida and all this. And they're like, for what? Uh, so the judge dismissed all of that. They, the judge up there is saying that I guess this, the, 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 the vendor is able to continue to be in this suit. But I don't see how you could possibly sustain a suit against the vendor. These folks signed forms saying that they were, were going to do, and they had opportunities that they didn't want to do. And the vendor treated them very well from what, I, from what I've seen in the reports, uh, providing food, lodging, all this other stuff. So, so it's a frivolous case. Uh, obviously, it was so frivolous against us at the state that, that, that there was no choice for the judge but to dismiss. And we knew that that was the right legal outcome. But I think it, the same should happen with the, um, w w with the company. But here's the thing. Uh, just having the borders open doesn't work. 
and I understand that there may be these elite liberal enclaves who, who want to advocate those policies, but they only do it as long as they don't have to face the consequences of those policies, and that's the problem. So I think that more and more people in New York City now, in Chicago, uh, residents you know, who may politically be different than, say, maybe the typical Florida voter, I think everyone is seeing, okay, just having an open border doesn't work. First of all, you don't know who the folks are. Uh, you are having people come in who are not doing, I mean, the number of military age males that you see coming across that border, uh, you know, do we, do we want to import 20,000 military age males from China? Is that in the U.S.'s interest? I don't think so. Do we want to import uh, 10,000 military age males from Libya? I don't think so. I don't think that's in our interest. But, and we don't know what's going to happen once they get in and what's going to happen. So, so you have all those problems. But even putting that aside, the sheer number of people that have poured in, it's overwhelming some of these communities because you have hospitals that get, that get uh, overwhelmed. You've got schools. You've got all these issues that happen. So one, there's a lot of, obviously, the illegality coming across the border. Uh, but then just the sheer number of it, there's not a structure and an order to it. That, that it really is uh, impacting the quality of life uh, of just hardworking Americans who are just trying to take care of their families. And so, so that's why the policy across the board has been a total failure. Uh, you know, we don't have, we, my first year as governor, we, we signed legislation banning sanctuary cities. I mean, some of these guys were in the legislature. I think Broder, Broder was there. And that was really important to do. And then everything we've done since then has been saying yes to rule of law, uh, but no to being a magnet for people uh, to come illegally. And so I think that we're doing it right, and I think we're going to continue to do it. All right, everybody. God bless. Thank you.